Great, thanks very much and uh, very grateful for the opportunity to be able to join you today. So I should also mention that I also work with uh, an organization called Sadaka, uh, the Ireland-Palestine Alliance and Glan Sadaka and Al Haq uh, in May of this year submitted a complaint uh, to Ireland's Criminal Assets Bureau uh, against the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund. So CAB or the Criminal Assets Bureau is the body in Ireland responsible for the civil recovery of proceeds of crime, uh, normally known for uh, knocking down doors and sealing, uh, seizing fancy cars, uh, but in this case something quite different. Uh, ISAF is essentially the Irish Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, and it has investments in 11 companies that are listed on the UN database of companies operating uh, in the Israeli settlements. Um, uh, actually, it withdrew its investments from uh, six of these companies, five Israeli banks and an Israeli retail uh, company, uh, but remains invested in uh, the remaining five, including a number of tourism companies, uh, such as Booking.com. It's also invested in 2.7 million euro worth of uh, Israeli government bonds, which we uh, addressed in a follow-up submission uh, after filing this uh, submission that was covered uh, in the Irish media in, in May. Uh, so as far as I know, the complaint uh, is among the uh, first number of complaints to be submitted uh, to various authorities invoking proceeds of crime and anti-money laundering uh, legislation in relation to investments linked to uh, Israeli war crimes. And so what I'm going to do is just go through some of the key elements uh, of our complaint, uh, which will hopefully show how this area of law can be used to uh, uh, hopefully at least uh, hold companies and other actors complicit in Israeli war crimes uh, to account. And I think it's also worth mentioning that the Irish proceeds of crime and money laundering regime uh, is very similar to the one in the UK and I suspect also uh, in other <coughs> jurisdictions. So this complaint has uh, relevance beyond uh, Ireland. So getting into some uh, definitions, uh, starting with the definition of proceeds of crime under uh, Irish law, the first thing uh, to mention is that it relates to the proceeds of any offence. So this is what's called an all crimes approach uh, to proceeds of crime. Uh, and uh, under two pieces of legislation actually in Ireland, um, the Geneva Conventions Act uh, and also the International Criminal Court Act, the grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions and the war crimes underpinning uh, the Israeli settlements, the transfer of civilian population uh, onto occupied territory, of course, and the appropriation, unlawful appropriation of property uh, are offences uh, under Irish uh, legislation. And crucially, uh, they are offences uh, in relation to which Irish courts uh, are vested a universal jurisdiction. Uh, so they're offences uh, under Irish law, no matter where or by whom uh, they are committed. And that, we have argued, um, means they are criminal conduct uh, for the purpose of the uh, definition of that term, which is part of the broader definition of uh, proceeds of crime uh, under Irish law. The question then, uh, or a key question for the purpose of our complaint is what is a proceed? Uh, and uh, there are two separate definitions for some reason uh, under uh, two pieces of Irish legislation, the Money Laundering <laughs> Act and then the Proceeds of Crime Act. Uh, not clear why um, there are these two, two definitions, but if we take uh, either of them and think, for example, of booking.com, uh, the revenue uh, that it generates in the settlements, according to our submission, uh, is uh, obtained through or by or in connection with uh, the, um, the offences underpinning the settlements because the settlements themselves could not exist uh, without those offences having been committed uh, and therefore the revenue generated by commercial activity in the settlements would not, could not have been obtained uh, without those offences uh, having been committed. But the, a, key, a key part, we're obviously not just concerned with the revenue that's generated in the settlements. We need to then go on to establish uh, that when this revenue gets mixed with legitimately obtained revenue uh, and makes its way uh, back 
to an Irish bank account, uh, possibly passing through various intermediary uh, funds, that it remains uh, the proceeds of crime. Uh, and crucial to this aspect of the complaint is this language, uh, directly or indirectly, in whole or in part, which appears actually in both pieces of legislation, but not within the definition of proceeds of crime itself uh, in the Proceeds of Crime Act. And it just helps to um, think here uh, what would be the position if we try to argue that the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund is aiding and abetting uh, the settlements through its investments. And it would be clear that the remoteness, that, that there's just too remote a link between uh, the fund uh, and the conduct that constitutes the offence for its investments to constitute uh, aiding and abetting. But with the proceeds of crime regime, uh, that remoteness uh, issue doesn't arise. In fact, the whole regime is designed to ensure that remoteness is not uh, a defence. And this was actually uh, emphasised in a decision uh, of the Court of Appeal uh, of England and Wales uh, just two weeks ago in a case uh, brought by my colleagues uh, with Bindman solicitors, uh, um, challenging imports of goods produced uh, with forced labour uh, into the UK. And it was accepted in that case um, both by the High Court uh, and uh, uh, even by the UK government that goods produced with forced labour uh, are the proceeds of crime. But the uh, Court of Appeal uh, mentioned that um, even if a uh, consignment of goods produced with forced labour um, passes through various points, on a supply chain a thousand miles long, uh, that it still remains the proceeds of crime. So emphasising uh, that that remoteness of defence just doesn't exist uh, in, um, in this particular uh, legal context. Um, the other uh, key issue then is the mixing uh, of funds, because of course it's only a tiny uh, fraction of, say, Booking.com's revenue that's actually generated uh, in the settlements goes into presumably one account and then out of that it pays its dividends or, or whatever else. And again, um, case law uh, from the UK courts is very helpful uh, on this point that even just one tiny amount of uh, money that is the proceeds of crime uh, going into uh, an account taints the entire, uh, contaminates the entire uh, um, pool of money. Uh, so hopefully this makes clear that if we can establish uh, that revenue connected to uh, Israeli crimes uh, is the proceeds of crime, that any business coming into contact uh, with this revenue uh, is exposed. And this is something uh, which has very serious consequences. Um, the offence of money laundering, which is essentially any physical uh, interaction with proceeds of crime carries a sentence of up to 14 years uh, imprisonment in Ireland uh, and it's a crime for which only uh, a person's belief uh, or in the UK suspicion needs to be established uh, in order to uh, establish the mental element of the offence and that's something that we can do by making a complaint of the kind we made and notifying for example, the Ireland Strategic Investment Fund of um, the links uh, uh, of its investments to, uh, to the, the war crimes in question. Uh, and I'll just conclude by saying that it's not just the um, offences linked to Israeli settlements that can operate as predicate offences for the purpose of proceeds of crime law. The offence of apartheid is also an offence under the domestic law of Ireland, of the UK, various other countries, uh, and that could also uh, in time provide the basis for a further uh, action of this kind, but linked to an offence that obviously has been committed uh, not just in the...